As you make your way to your seats this morning, grateful to the Lord to provide such a beautiful day to worship. As you get your feet off the coffee table and and get yourself focused in on your TV, we're glad you could join us that way as well. Uh, We're just grateful that we have the opportunity to worship the Lord, apart or near, um, but to just raise our voices in praise of his glory and his grace, his love and his constant provision, uh, his endless, endless peace. A few announcements to start the day. A compassion table is still set up from last week, so feel free to go over and take a look at that. I believe Danielle will be here uh, at least second service or maybe possibly even between service to, to have any questions answered that way, but you're always welcome to uh, email or talk to Charles or I as well about that. We can get you in contact, but the table is there to take a look at the children that are available for sponsorship through Compassion, um, and then we can also give you a link to the video if you didn't see the video from last week to kind of give you a better hint on what's going on that direction. This week is foundation (coughs) ministry starting on Wednesday, so if you've got uh, kids, uh, fifth, sixth grade, fifth, fifth grade through high school, that's the ministry uh, that uh, is for that age group. So if you know anybody that's interested in that, you can see Pastor Charles, and he will uh, get you hooked up with that. Also, uh, on Sundays now, I have a ministry for 20s uh, into early 30s or late 30s in my case, and uh, (laughs) if anyone is interested in that ministry as well, that meets at my house and we'll be studying uh, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. And so that's this afternoon. Uh, Coming up is our congregational meeting on October 4th, and with that there are our budget and our uh, absentee ballots as you walk out the door before you get to the outside to the right, where we used to have our snacks and coffee and things, the the ballot is there. So if you need to vote absentee, if you're not going to be here, if you're a member and you're not going to be here on October 4th, or uh, if you are online, we will be sending some of those out. Or if you know somebody here that can grab you an absentee ballot and bring it to you, that is another option. But we need those back before the 4th. So if we can get those back by next Sunday, that would be great. Um, So those ballots will be going out this week in the mail, but they're also in the back there. And also our budget is back there as well for you to take a look at. That same Sunday is Life Chain Sunday. Uh, We will be having a video on that next week, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on that right now. But that is uh, from 2 to 3.30, October 4th. We'll be standing on the corner of 11 and by the BP there. Um, What is that cross street? Chuck, what's the cross street over there? Whatever the cross street is <laughs> by the BP off 11 across the, uh, the ferry road tracks from Casey's. Uh, it's an opportunity to stand up to pray. You can hold a sign. You don't have to hold a sign. But really what it says is that life matters. Life matters more than this world understands. A life matters uh, because of who gives life. Uh, really standing out there says more than I'm a Republican and I believe that we need to change laws. No, it says that abortion is murder. <clears throat> and we need to stop killing children. That's what it says. It says that God created each of us in his image with his glory in mind, with his righteousness and holiness and beauty and perfection inside each one of us. That's being in his image from conception. Standing up there says that is of greater importance than any law. That's of greater importance than any social construct that might stand against it. So please consider joining us on the 4th. With that, um, let us turn our minds to that God, that God who gives us his grace, that God who shows us his holiness and his righteousness and his word, who came to earth and lived with us that we might know it in truth, and that changes our hearts and our minds that we might seek him and find him, because he's not far from any one of us. Let's rise as I read Psalm 13. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. And I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Let us sing his praise, for he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is God, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever.
thinking about the two songs that we're singing we just sang about God being faithful to us and I thought about that marine uh, their motto is semper fidelius which is in Latin and it means always faithful right well God's always faithful but we sometimes aren't right and um, so um, in 1 Corinthians 4 2 it says moreover um, it is required uh, in stewards that one be found faithful and this next song talks about that uh, it's kind of a, a prayer to God to um, uh, uh, just ask us to give us hearts that that are that way okay Show us the measure of your grace revealed. 
Thanks for uh, singing with us. You can have a seat, and Abigail is going to come up and pray with, for us and with us. Good morning. Thank you for for joining me in prayer now. Lord God, you are enthroned forever, Lord. You have established your throne for justice, and you judge the world with righteousness. And like we just sang, Lord, uh, your love drowns out fear. Fear has to do with punishment, and we're your children, so we don't have to fear that perfect justice that's been covered in the justice of uh, Christ on the cross. We just thank you for that. Lord, Psalm 9 says, those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So Lord, we do know you and we do put our trust in you. And we come this morning to seek your face. You promise that you don't forsake those who seek you. So we come pleading that promise, Lord. We come, I think, this morning in many different frames, Lord. Some of us are full of joy to be together. Some of us are maybe just desperate to have some time with you. Some of us are weary from last week, and some of us are anxious about next week. Some of us are frustrated, I imagine. Some of us are just feeling impatient with how things are in 2020, Lord. But we all, we're here. We come humbly to you, acknowledging that we are like grass that withers, but that you are forever, Lord. And because we know you and we are in you, we can have life. We just thank you, Lord, for that. 
We also know, Lord, that you desire truth in the innermost parts. So we ask you to search us, Lord. Know our hearts. Try us. Know our our cares, our thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in us. Lord, we know that it, it does grieve you when your sons and daughters don't live in love. So we do ask that you would search our hearts and Reveal to us if there's bitterness or or envy or resentment that we're harboring against brothers and sisters. We know that grieves you, Lord. And Lord, if even now in those few seconds we've been aware of that, we just pray that you'll help us make that right and forgive us, Lord. We want to walk as you walked, Lord. We want to walk with a love that is patient and kind and not irritable and not keeping a record of wrongs. Lord, we just pray that you would lead us in the way everlasting. We just thank you that you are so faithful and just to forgive us. We love that. We thank you for that. And we also thank you that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness so we don't have to to walk around with that shame and dirt like we just sang about, Lord. We're freed from that. Faithful creator, you are also the giver of all good gifts. And uh, you want us to present our request to you with thanksgiving and with confidence, Lord, knowing that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us and we know that if you hear us, we have whatever we ask. So we just know that it is your will that people all over the earth hear the good news, and also that we make disciples of all the nations. So we just would pray for starting right here at home, as Pastor John mentioned, for Awana and Foundation starting this week after six months apart, Lord. We just ask that those ministries and those uh, volunteers and leaders would flourish, Lord, that they'd feel your presence and your strength as they go forth. And we just ask that they would bear fruit uh, for your kingdom, God. Lord, we also would join um, our missionaries, Stan and Jennifer Pulowski, out in Virginia, Lord. And they ask us to pray along with them that they could get settled in their new home in Blacksburg, and also that you would help them build relationships with the Chinese students who are there. And Lord, it's been hard because of the COVID restrictions. So we just pray that you would guide them, like we just pray, guide them and lead them and um, help some relationships that you've already ordained just come to pass so that Stan and Jennifer could pour in and share your love that they just long to do. And Lord, we do present our request that you would you would comfort. We know the Venden family lost Eric's dad this week. We pray that you'll bless them and strengthen them. Maria's brother Tom, that he would have a full recovery. And Lord, there's so many in our body uh, who are suffering, whether it's physically or mentally, Lord. I just pray that they would know the presence of you, that they would feel your presence and know your love. And for the election season, God, with Daniel, Lord, we just know that you're the one who changes times and seasons. You're the one who removes kings. You're the one who sets up kings, presidents, Lord. You give wisdom to the wise and to those who have understanding You give more. We just want to be those people, Lord, who have understanding. And we just thank you that your word says you are good and upright. Therefore, you instruct sinners in the way we should go. So we just thank you for that. We thank you that you care enough to instruct and guide us. We just ask that you'd help us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives while we wait for Jesus Christ to return, Lord. And finally, now as Pastor Charles comes up, we just pray that you, you, Lord, Holy Spirit, would illumine to us your word and uh, make it come alive. Give us hearts that really want to hear and obey for your glory. Amen. Abigail, for the prayers and the worship team, it's good to be together this morning and uh, Welcome those who are watching online as well. A couple things. Uh, this Wednesday is foundation is beginning, so we're excited about that. Parents are also welcome to join us this Wednesday as well. We'll kind of go over what our ministry is going to look like and 
uh, let you see kind of what we're all about. So we invite the parents of uh, foundation, middle school, high school age kids to join us uh, this coming Wednesday and then the following Wednesday, Awana begins on the 30th? I don't know if that's right. Whatever the date of two Wednesdays is from now, that's when that starts. So, Also, a couple other things. I know that I'm wearing um, Lions colors, but I'm not a Lions fan. And I'm also wearing a t-shirt because it's still summer, even though it's freezing. I refuse to change. I think it is. When does, when does fall come? Tomorrow? 21st, 22nd, somewhere in there? I don't know. Something like that. Anyways. <laughs> At the time of uh, Paul's writing to Titus, that we're studying the book of Titus, Roman society was experiencing a significant social revolution. For the past 40 or 50 years or so, Roman women were throwing off certain aspects of traditional way of life that they were expected to live, and they were demanding more freedom. It's interesting that the people of Crete, the women of Crete, were leaders and influencers in this movement that had spread throughout much of the Roman Empire, particularly in Italy and other places uh, of Roman influence in this movement of what we might call Rome, women's liberation. And, and while certain aspects of this revolution did have positive aspects, right, uh, there were some detrimental things as well. The positive aspects were greater financial and legal protections for women, especially in divorce cases, not that we want to be proponents of divorce, but in those cases, particularly in Roman society, before these changes, Roman uh, wives were in a very, very uh, unfortunate or uh, dangerous position in a divorce case, but they were starting to gain more rights and property rights and uh, could find more legal protection. So that was a positive aspect of some of the changes in their society. The negative aspects related to throwing off temperance and sexual modesty and emulating and striving for some of the uh, uh, sexual freedoms and uh, drunkenness that men were accustomed to in their society. It's very interesting when you study Roman history, uh, in Roman society, from the old republic to the new, men had very little uh, expectations of them sexually. In fact, they were allowed and even expected to engage in premarital sex, to visit prostitutes, to have courtesans, to engage in homosexual behavior with adolescent boys before they were married. And you might think, well, after marriage, that stuff would be curbed, but that was not necessarily the case, that they were not expected to remain sexually faithful to their wife. And in fact, they were encouraged to pursue lustful relationships with women outside of their marriage. In an excellent and really enlightening book called Roman Wives, Roman Widows by Dr. Winter, he points out these practices or this belief writing this, the early second century AD writer, Plutarch, presents the rationalization of the husband's behavior in speech that was traditionally, in a speech that was traditionally delivered in the nuptial bedroom. So think about this, a couple's just gotten married and this is what would be delivered to the couple, this address, this idea. And the speech included, it demanded of the wife both her faithfulness to him and his gods and the acceptance of his casual sexual liaisons. Plutarch justified the husband's activity on the grounds that extramarital escapades were a means of gratifying his lust, for it would be entirely inappropriate for him to use his wife in this way. In another illustration, when L. alias Caesar's wife criticized his adulterous behavior, he was said to have justified this by asking her to let him exercise his lust on other women because his wife was for dignitas, not sensuality. And dignitas is a fancy Roman word that refers to proper order and how things are done. And uh, so what we clearly see is this concept in Roman culture that men pretty much had license to do whatever they wanted sexually, and women were very much uh, to keep that within their households. The new Roman woman, as Roman scholars call them, were women, usually from the ruling and the wealthy and the middle classes, who wanted to have the same sexual and drinking and social freedoms as their husbands and other men in their culture. And it's interesting that while this was developing, while this social revolution was happening, some Roman leaders, including Caesar Augustus, other philosophers, religious leaders, tried to counter this social revolution, rightly pointing out that this behavior would undermine the Roman family and create many social ills. They even started to call Roman men to live chaste lives. Well, maybe not chaste, but at least to put some limits on how they pursued their extramarital affairs. And so clearly, much of Roman culture was focused on sinfully indulging in pleasurable behaviors such as drunkenness and sexual immorality. 
And I start with all of this because knowing this is important for our text today because Paul is writing to a church leader in Titus about how can he help Christians there live more like Jesus and how he's called them to live than their Roman and their Cretan culture that they have grown up in or they are a part of, that they will continue to be tempted by. And God calls his children to a standard of godliness and holiness that does not always line up with the cultures we live in. In fact, often it will not. And so Paul is telling Titus, you need to instruct in the godly right ways because we need to know God's ways to live and we need to know that we have his help through the transforming power of the gospel and God's word and the work of the Holy Spirit so that we can put off these sinful, destructive, ungodly ways of our culture and our flesh and our sinful desires and instead live according to how God has called us to live. And so we're in a section in Titus that is talking to various segments of the church, the older men and older uh, and younger men we looked at last week. And this morning we're going to begin looking at what was the instruction to older women and to younger women. I, I've divided, decided to divide this sermon into two parts because there's so much. There are only three verses, but they're packed full of stuff. So uh, I didn't want to short shrift some of these comments, especially in light of how they might be understood in our own culture. And so we're going to divide this up into two sermons. But I invite you to turn with me in your Bible to Titus 2, or your Bible app to Titus chapter 2. We're going to read Titus 2. I'm going to start in verse 1 and then jump to verse 3. I started in verse 1 to put in context what is happening here. Uh, Paul is writing. He says, you, however, speaking to Titus, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And so we're in this section of Titus where he is instructing Titus to teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. How does sound doctrine impact our lives? We talked about that last week. And that idea continues into this week as we receive Paul's instructions to the older and younger women in the church in Crete. And so in verse 3, Paul writes this, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers, or, or gossips is a similar word within the same frame there, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. And then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. We're going to look more closely at verses 3 and 4 this morning. Paul begins here and he says, living as godly older women, and I'm not going to define older women because we're all young women here. I just realized culturally we're just going to go with that. I'm not getting into that thing. And it's interesting that none of the commentators or scholars I read talked about the, the categories of older women as well. But nonetheless, this word is used. Live your lives as older women or women. It, it means to be reverent, to be self-controlled in speech and conduct and mentors to younger women. We see this in verse 3. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. Not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Uh, Paul begins here and he says, Titus, teach these ladies that they need to live in a life that is reverent in how they live, that, that shows reverence. What does he mean by being reverent? Well, reverent carries the idea of thinking and doing religious practices. It comes from uh, sort of the, the, the strictest interpretation of that word comes from doing the rituals and performing religious duties. But the broader range of that word, and I think the way Paul would be using it here, is to live in a way that honors God, that is befitting of what he asks you to do as his people, as his daughters. It's the idea, I think, similar to what Paul called the older men to live a life worthy of respect. The women are to live reverent in their behavior, in the way they live. Older Christian women are to be devoted, to be pious, to be devout, and honor God with their lives. It's a, it's a call to godliness and desire to know and love and obey God in all areas of life. And if we think about this, the, the fundamental thing for all of us as Christians, whether women or men, is this concept of reverence or living reverent life or being worthy of respect, living worthy of respect. Why? Because to enter into relationship with God, 
means that we've come to a point in our life where we have acknowledged we're sinful, that we are separated from God, that we have rebelled against God, that we have not lived in a way that God has called us to live. And we've acknowledged that that isn't good. That's not good for us. That's not good for others. That's certainly not good in our relationship with God because it means I'm separated from him and am facing life without God's guidance and love and presence and care. But even more critically, I'm facing eternity separated from him in hell. And so to, to, to come to the point where we admit that we are sinners, that we need God's grace and forgiveness and mercy that we want to be released from the guilt that we carry, the shame that comes from that because of our sin, is a statement of we want to live differently, that we don't want that old life. We don't want the lies of the world, the lies of our flesh and of the evil one. And so it's a statement that says, I want to live a reverent life. I want to live a life that honors God. It's a desire to say, I want to be different. I now want to be devoted to him, and I'm willing to do the things that he's called me to do in prayer, in scripture reading, in worship, in fellowship, in service, and and developing my love for him because I know what he has saved me from, and I know that I'm a child of God and I'm able to be his. So Paul is saying, listen, help these older ladies to realize, and us as men as well, and younger men and younger women, to help us realize, listen, to live as a Christian means to live as a reverent person, devoted to the things of God, desiring the things of God, wanting to follow those things, and working with God to get rid of the things that prevent us from doing that. He goes on to say that godly older women should not be slanderers nor alcoholics, Just like other older men, godly women should be temperate, should not be given to too much alcohol. If we're right about this idea of the new Roman wives issue that might be going on in Crete, then this admonition not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine fits right in with those vices that was happening. Uh, The Romans, especially in the middle to upper and ruling classes, were famous for their banquets, for their parties. They would invite many friends and, and, and political people and influencers of their society to their homes and have lavish meals and then drink a lot. And then afterwards, there would be sexual shenanigans that would go on. Uh, between men and women that were there, and now women were engaging in that. And and it's interesting, in the the Republic era of Rome, there was very, very uh, strict censure on women being drunk. I actually learned that the word tipsy comes from the Greek concept or the Roman concept of tipple, which was wine. And the husbands would hug their wives and smell their breath and say, uh, you've got tipple on your breath, you're tipsy, you've been drinking, and that wasn't appropriate for women to drink. Uh, I found that very fascinating. So the reality is, is in the older age of the Republic, women did not engage in sexual immorality. Or, I mean, they did, of course, but they were severely, severely punished and looked down upon for that, and they were not to drink. Now we're in a new era where women are like, hey, if the, what's good for the man is good for me. And so they're engaging in all of this sort of thing. And so if it's true that Crete was following or some of the women within this church came from this culture or were t- tempted to enter into or continue in that culture, Paul is speaking to them and he's saying, listen, as godly Christian women, alcohol drunkenness uh, with alcohol is not right for the Christian, just like it was for the older man. He goes on to say that Christian women should also not be slanderers or gossips. And it's easy to understand how in the context of a large banquet and party and people are talking and drunk, how slander and gossip could be rife and constantly being told it's not appropriate. And so Paul wants Titus to remind these older women that drunken revelries and slander and gossip, while it might have been normal for their life outside of Jesus and outside of the church, now that they have come to faith in Christ, it's not appropriate for a Christian. They need to be taught and encouraged instead to use their words as a positive force to help others, to be encouragement, to share the gospel. And if we think about this warning today, while most of us in our church here are not engaging in drunken revelries, at least I hope not, the reality is, is drunkenness is still a temptation to us. And secondly, gossip is 
something that we can enter into, that we can give into, that it's easy to get into f- talking about other people's lives in ways that are destructive and harmful and hurt their relationships with others. And so women in our church, listen to God's word and take to heart the action and commitment to not slander others or gossip about their lives. It hurts them and it reveals a character in your heart that's not kind and gracious and forgiving and loving as God has called us to. In the end of verse three here, Paul calls Titus to encourage these older women to this sort of life, this temperate life, and to not gossip. Why? So that these godly older women can live holy lives that they might be able to help younger women to mature and grow in their faith as well. The word teach what is good in other settings actually has an idea or connotation to it of call back to their senses. It's a word that stresses the importance of coming back to right thinking and behaving. It's part of the word group of self-control. So it implies instruction and teaching and persuasion uh, to speak to people in such a way to say, hey, you need to come back to reality. You need to come back to your senses. What you are thinking, what you are engaging in is ludicrous and damaging and not what God wants. Come back to your senses. It's got that sort of force to it, that meaning to it, that urgency to it. And what Paul is saying is that in order for an older woman to be able to provide that ministry, that service, that compassion, that kindness to a younger woman who who may be looking around society and saying, boy, what they're offering seems a lot better than what my traditional views have or my traditional culture, or even what godly views on how to living are, is the older women are to say, hey, hey, come back to your senses here. Maybe through their own experiences to say, hey, I lived as that new Roman woman for a while, and sure, it looked great, but let me tell you the damage that caused to my soul, the damage that caused to my body, the damage that it caused to my relationship with my husband and my children and my reputation in society, my inability to to truly be free because I was trapped in alcohol and sex. Whatever it might be, you could see how these older women are in a position to come to these younger women if they are living self-controlled godly lives themselves. It allows them to come to those younger women and say, hey, don't buy the lie. Come back to your senses. Realize that God's way is always best. No matter how tempting and empowering and liberating the world around us might seem, if it's not following God's truth and God's ways, it will enslave you. Come back to your senses. And so the text then turns to what do we urge or what, are, what is Titus to urge these younger women? And he starts by focusing on their family lives. He says, living as godly younger married women means to love your husband and your children. He says, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children. We'll stop at that verse. It's an interesting thing. It would seem obvious to me that a wife should love her husband. That that almost seems like, hey, that should go without being said, right? I mean, that's sort of the point of the whole thing is love. But the fact that Paul is calling Titus to call these younger women back to their senses, using that word and that phrase, regarding this most primary relationship suggests that, yes, we are dealing in Crete with with at least some women who have bought into the new Roman woman lifestyle. Dr. Winter says this, writing, in the light of the evidence produced in connection with the number of injunctions given to these young Cretan Christian wives, it is suggested that they had been influenced by some of their secular married sisters. Terminology used in Titus to counter the situation in Crete fits well with what is known of the new Roman woman's conduct with lack of interest in the welfare of the household which Cretan women had to demonstrate their ability to run before marrying. The neglect of her husband as well as her children, presumably in favor of social life that might involve casual extramarital affairs, is also commented on. The call, therefore, was for the young Christian wives to come to their senses and no longer follow the secular trend. 
Just as such a promiscuous mindset earned the disapproval of the philosophical schools and might attract legal penalties under Roman law, so too there was a strong rebuke given to young Christian wives. And so Paul is urging Titus, he's saying, listen, they need to realize, hey, you're married, you need to love your husband. And in their culture, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. It would seem to be obvious to us because of the way we join together. But, but as I've been studying this, it was not uncommon for a girl to marry not long after uh, reaching physical maturity, so 12 to 15, 16, somewhere in there, and then she would marry a husband who was 10 years older who had a life of, of promiscuity sexually and, and freedom to do whatever he wanted. And so you can imagine the stress and anxiety and troubles that were involved in those marriages. And yet Paul is saying to them, listen, do what you can to urge these women to love their husbands, to be faithful to them, to not to not put off the immorality and the injustice of how Roman society treated wives, which is wrong, right? It's wrong to expect and allow your husbands to be unfaithful. But the answer is not to say, well, let the wives do the same thing. The answer is for the Christian woman to say, I'm going to live to the standards that God has called me to as a wife, which means to be loving to my husband. And in the context of of what was going on in Rome, that meant not to engage and pursue in extramarital affairs and drunkenness. The reality is, is that women today still face similar temptations as the wives of Rome. You know, marriage is a wonderful gift to us, but it's also very difficult. One of the realities that sets in very soon for a young married couple or an older married couple is that A husband is not always romantic, not always lovable, not always self-controlled, not always wise, not always attentive to his spouse. You know, when we're dating, I think us guys are pretty good at spending a lot of time and doing the romantic gestures and wooing that girl that we're infatuated and, and hopefully will turn into love and doing all of the romantic stuff together. But once marriage, happens, you know, there's that honeymoon phase, we even call it, right, where things are great and you're still doing that and you're enjoying life. And, but after a while, you know, things start to settle into reality and routines and challenges arise, right? We got to go to work. That means waking up early and I see you early and, and I realize maybe you're not great to talk to the first thing in the morning and give you a cup of coffee and then we'll talk after work <laughs> because it's better for our marriage, right? The realities of, of, of life and stress, the challenges of work, making decisions together when we have different ideas and opinions, when we start having children, that's a major stressor upon the relationship We face sickness, we face conflicts with extended family. There's the mundane experiences of chores and all the stuff of life, and all of a sudden you start to realize, wow, this is not... There's a reason why all of the great romance movies stop at the marriage or the engagement, right? The sequels aren't really there of how did they manage the castle together as husband and prince and king or whatever it would be, right? This reality can certainly take the luster off of our relationship. And if we don't handle those differences of opinion and the conflicts and the challenges of life well, it's very easy to become frustrated and angry and resentful and jealous and isolated from each other. And so if we think about a young wife and a wife that's lived with a husband for a while, we can imagine that it starts to mind would start to wander to better days or better options when it comes to romance and life partners and the temptation for affairs and extramarital sex can grow stronger. And so I think the warning for ourselves in this text is for wives to tend their hearts and minds and actions as it relates to loving their husbands so they will not turn to other men. Right, the lie of the extramarital affair is that it will provide you with something that you're missing in your marriage. That might be romance and sexual excitement. That might be a listening ear. That might be more attention and time or whatever than your husband gives you. Maybe just the excitement of the secret of it. But the truth of the extramarital affair is that it brings 
the truth is it is built upon deception, selfishness. You are engaging with another human being who will demonstrate the same or worse qualities you are trying to escape from your spouse. Because a man who has an affair with you is not the kind of person you can build a strong, lasting, meaningful relationship with. The other truth of the extramarital affair is that they are far too costly. They cost us our trustworthiness because to violate our most sacred and important human relationship is a sign of selfishness and manipulation. And a person who engages in that is not trustworthy. Extramarital affairs cause us, cost us our sense of peace and happiness because if you are a Christian, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will not let you live in that deception, in that sin, without serious conviction, without shame, without guilt, until it's repented of, until it's confessed and acknowledged. Extramarital affairs cost us the loss of esteem and respect of our spouse and our children and our friends when they become known. They're costly. The lie is, oh, you can keep it secret. It won't hurt anything. It'll be fine. It'll fulfill whatever you're missing in your marriage. You'll find a better person. The truth is far darker and far opposite of that. So there's a warning here and an opportunity here to wives to say, hey, you need to tend your heart and mind to continue to love your husband. But there's also an opportunity here for both the husband and wife to say, what is it that we can do to continue to develop our marriage, to grow in our loving thoughts and actions towards each other as we go through these experiences of life? Do we make time for romance? Do we still go on dates? Do we buy the gifts and the cards? Are we experiencing sexual intimacy? Are we having fun together? Are we doing things that we both enjoy? You know, that changes over time with physical limitations and reality that maybe there needs to be a readjustment of what we did when we were in our 20s, we can't do in our 40s and 50s, but we can still do some stuff together that we enjoy. What is that? Let's make time for that and build that into our relationship so that we have fun together, that we remember and experience and rekindle that fun that we had when we were dating and romancing and wooing and enjoying life free of all of the stuff of marriage of 20, 30 years and kids and grandkids and work and finances and all of that, right? Are we talking about the struggles we're having in our marriage sooner than later? The sooner you deal with the stuff that's going on, the more peaceful and the better the clear conversations can be. We all know that as the longer I hold on to my struggles, that builds up the intensity. More things get added to it. It can lead to animosity and anger and bitterness, and then it blows up instead of having a conversation that can be peaceful and helpful. Are we thanking God daily for our spouse? Are we expressing gratitude and thankfulness to them? Yeah, we're not perfect. None of us are. I've got flaws. You've got flaws. Your spouse has flaws. But there's also good things there. Are we thanking God for your husband or your wife for what they do in your life, what they do in the world, the privilege you have to share with them in their work or their ministry or their life or whatever it is and grateful for what God is doing in them. Are you grateful for how they care for your home and for your family and your children? Are you expressing that to God so that your own heart can sort of reflect and meditate on, yeah, this is the good things? You can always find the bad. Those, those come up very obvious. But boy, it's helpful and it's good, good advice to speak kind, grateful, thankful words to your spouse about what they do. Thanks for that great meal. Thanks for going shopping. Thanks for watching the kids today. Thanks for going to work and earning money for our family. Thanks for taking time to spend time with me even though I know you've been really busy or stressed. Whatever it would be. The reality is there's things to be thankful for and it helps keep balance and perspective in our lives. So I ask you, married women in our church, how are you doing at loving your husbands? Does he know you love him by your words and your actions? Does he know you respect him? Does he know you're grateful for the things he does to help you personally and to partner with you in raising your children and enjoying your grandchildren? Does he know you forgive him and want to help him be who God wants him to be, not what you want him to be? Does he know that you care for him 
I want to share the joys and the burdens of life with him. These are important things. And so Paul is saying to these young women, pr principles that carry on far beyond the sexual immorality and challenges and drunkenness of the new Roman woman, but apply to all of us who are married and women who are married to say, love your husband well. And God's word's got a lot to say about that. And there's lots of practical and things that we can do to do that. Godly women also, or married women with children or women with children need to be devoted and loving mothers. Then they, verse four again, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children. Again, this would seem obvious to me. <laughs> but as we saw of the prior quotation from Dr. Winter, if it's true this new Roman woman lifestyle was happening, there was a malicious reality that was happening that homes were being neglected, that children were being neglected for the pleasures they were seeking, for the status they were pursuing, for the new lives they may wanted to have apart from their current husband. And the love of their children to care for their children appropriately was being lost. We'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, next week when we look at the idea of being homemaker or taking care of the home. But the reality is, as Christian women, right, we, we know that raising children is a gift from God. It comes with great expectations and, and responsibilities, and it calls you to depend upon the Lord for wisdom and strength and help from your husband, if possible, the church, other friends, family resources, right? It's a, it's a beautiful, wonderful gift, and it comes with a lot of challenges that drive us to the Lord. And so to love our children means, or women, to love your children means, are you seeking God and his help and his strength in that? Are you desiring to show them that love and, and raise them to be the godly people that God wants them to be? This is true for us, you know, today there's lots of opportunities and temptations to make other things more important than family. And this is not a sermon against working outside the home for women, I have no issue with that, my wife does, it's good for our family, it's good for our kids. But it raises the reality that there are lots of things beyond just work, beyond, there's lots of things that we're tempted to look at as people and I think as women that say, this is gonna give me meaning and purpose and it's the wrong thing, and in pursuing that wrong thing, the people that God has entrusted us with, husbands and children, are getting hurt, and they're getting lost. They're not being cared for as they're called to be cared for. And as a Christian woman, as God has gifted you a child, you have this amazing gift and responsibility to raise that child and make that a priority in life and how that's accomplished and partnering with your husband or the child father in order to make that happen. And I want to end with what he says in the end of verse 5 here. The reason why, or one of the reasons why, beyond the obvious positives for family life and peace in life and, and, and obedience to God, but he says, when a woman lives a godly life, her example points others to the gospel and God's word and the joy and the freedom of living as God calls us to live as his children. The end of verse 5, summing up sort of all that he has said to women, older and younger, so that no one will malign the word of God. Right, there is a reality that the world watches us, right? The world sees what we do. We watch the world, the watch, world watches us in return. And following God's truth in his word about how we are to live brings him glory, it brings him honor. It reveals the power of the gospel to change hearts and minds and give us freedom from sin and the ability to change and transform. And so you can imagine that if you have an older woman who has engaged in lots of drunkenness and social revelries and maybe had many men and all, and she comes to faith in Jesus and she starts to transition her life away from that and her friends that used to go to the parties and do all that stuff with her saying, why are you giving up on this great freedom and awesomeness we have? And she says, well, to be honest, it wasn't that great. And secondly, and most importantly, it's not what God wants me to do. I want to be free for real. And let me share with you how that happened in my life. It's because I understood I needed forgiveness of my sins. And this man, Jesus, who's also God, freed me from my sin, freed me from my in in slavery to alcohol and, and the sexual life. And now I have real freedom. Now I have real freedom. That's a powerful testimony to the reality of the life that has changed. And the same is true for us today that as we live Christian lives, as you live Christian lives as godly women, 
you're going to live in a way that's different than some of the ways of the world, and that behavior is going to seem weird, and they may even call it dangerous at times, but God the Holy Spirit can use that to convict the hearts of those around us of their sin and their rebellion and draw them to faith. It points to the word of God when we live as he's called us to. And it helps others come to faith. And it helps other Christians to walk in faith and truth. So what have we seen this morning? We saw this morning that women live godly lives when they're reverent, when they're not slanders, but they use their words, words for good. They're self-controlled in life, especially as it relates to alcohol, and they're loving to their spouses and children. And in so doing, God is honored, and the word of God is not disparaged by their actions. This hits on some pretty major points of difficulty in our lives as people. And hearing a sermon like this, I think at times can certainly make one feel inadequate and like a failure. We all have character qualities and behaviors that we engage in that we know don't live up to God's standards. And the good news is that God loves you and he cares for you and he wants to forgive your sin and he wants to help you in your failures and your rebelliousness to grow and mature and turn away from those things and become more like Jesus in how you think and how you act. And so as we turn to communion, let me urge you to see God's love for you, his forgiveness for sinfulness, and his desire to be present and help you through the Holy Spirit and his word to live more like him. These character qualities that we've looked at take work on our part. We need to actively think about and do things to resist temptation. We need to confess our sins. We need to reach out and get help when we're struggling with our marriage and raising our children. But we are not alone in this task. And God gives us the ability and the power to live it out. In fact, it comes from him. We see this in Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my present, but now much more in my absence... Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? What is he talking about? Living the reality of our faith in Christ, obedience to him. Fear and trembling is a recognition that, hey, I've got some responsibility in this to obey and follow God. But then verse 13 comes in, he says, for it is God who works in you and to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. We have this wonderful promise, this wonderful reality that, yes, we are called to take serious our obedience and our walk with Jesus. But he is the one, first through the power of the gospel, our surrendering to him, the Holy Spirit who indwells us, that convicts us and shows us the truth and empowers us and works with us and urges and nudges and, and moves within us that we might obey and follow his truth. You are not alone in this struggle to be a godly woman. God is with you, and he loves you, and he cares for you, and he's present to help you live out what he's called you to live. And that is great hope. That is great peace. That's great comfort. That assures us wisdom of God and the power of God to live as he's called us to live. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward uh, as we take communion this morning. And would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this truth that Paul speaks through your will to us even down through the centuries today. Lord, we are grateful for the godly women in our lives who are examples to us of what it means to know you, to love you, to obey you, to follow you. Lord, I pray for the women in our congregation, the ones who are single or married or widowed or the ones with children without, the ones that are married with children or perhaps have children with no husband or father in the picture. Lord, we know that you have blessed them with gifts and abilities and opportunities. And there's many challenges in life that they face and temptations. So Lord, we pray that you would strengthen their faith and their love for you, their commitment to obey, that they would find the support and encouragement of husband or friends or and friends, Lord, and, and church and your word and your spirit to grow and to mature and become all that they can be as your daughters that you love. Lord, we ask that you would protect us from our flesh and the evil one who would lead us to consider extramarital affairs and premarital sex and 
promiscuity as a path to freedom and or happiness or pleasure or escape or whatever the temptation might be. Lord, may we see that for the lie that it is and celebrate and rejoice. Sexual intimacy is it's designed to be within a loving husband and wife relationship. Lord, we pray that you would protect us from the temptation of alcohol and drunkenness, of overconsumption. That, Lord, that would not grab our hearts and minds and our bodies and lead us into dangerous and harmful places, but free us from that. And those who struggle, Lord, may you give us the ability to continue to live sober lives and to face the things that brought us to that point and to be free from it so that we can live and obey and follow you. Lord, we pray for our, our willingness to speak words that are positive and encouraging, to not be gossips or slanderers, but to be concerned about others, to speak words that build up others. We're grateful for your instruction, and we're most grateful that you're present with us to help us live it out. And so we humble our hearts and ask that you would help us to do that today under your strength and your power, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Communion in our church is for those who've trusted in Christ and have a relationship with him. If you've made that decision, you're welcome to join us this morning. If you haven't, let the elements pass you by. I or Pastor John, the handsome man with the bandana, would be glad to talk with you. And uh, I should say well-dressed. I don't know if he's handsome or not, but he's (laughs) well-dressed. Uh, we'd be glad to talk with you about how you can know, know Christ and, and take communion with us. But I want to read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Let's pass the bread together. The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together this morning. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for the life that we have because of your death. The life that we have because you broke the bonds of death and rose to life. The life that we have because we are justified, declared right, because our sins are forgiven and your righteousness is given to us when we acknowledge our need and our dependence upon you alone as the one that can forgive. The life that we have that guides us and directs us, and gives us wisdom on how to live in a world that is confused and lost and clouded with sin and selfish. The life that we can live when we acknowledge our, our, our sinfulness in those areas and confess and change our minds and repent. The life that we live now that points us to the perfection and holiness we will have with you in eternity. That life that will be glorious forever. Thank you for the life that we have. In Jesus' name. Amen. I dismiss you with these words from 2 Peter. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Have a wonderful afternoon.